grace to you and peace from God our Savior, Jesus the Redeemer, and the King of Love, in His name, Amen. Well, last week, if you recall, we talked about love, right? Our love as Christians, and we learned that uh, love is patient and kind, and endures all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Today, I'd like to look with you at another angle on Christian love, namely keeping our love alive and burning and shining brighter and not growing weary in it and letting it cool off. Have you ever felt your love cool off? Well, this is something that Jesus warns us about, actually, of the last days. Uh, over here in Matthew chapter 24, verse 12. Let's start there. Jesus says this in prophecy. He says, um, that's, uh, verse 12, And because wickedness is multiplied, most men's love will grow cold. Think about that. In the very end of the world, he says most men. Think about the word most. Yikes, right? I mean, most men, most people's love will grow cold. Namely, it will fail, it will decline, it will grow weary, and people will begin to give up on it. And so today, I thought we could take a look today at not growing cold or weary or throwing in the towel in love, but burning brighter on it so that we can actually fulfill another word from, from God's word, namely Proverbs 4, which says, the path of the righteous is like the light of dawn, which shines brighter and brighter until full day. Would you like to grow brighter in love and not duller and cooler and colder? Well, let's take a look at that today. What, can, what does God teach us about love in the last days? Well, first of all, he says that... Um, it is possible for a person's love to cool, right? We just read that. Of the last days, he says, because wickedness is multiplied, most men's love will grow cold. You probably all remember that word from, uh, from Revelation chapter 2, right? With uh, Jesus' words to the church at Ephesus. He says, commends them, and then he says, but I have this against you, that you abandon the love that you had at first, your first love, right? So it is possible for a church, for Christians, to grow colder and to uh, lose uh, their love. And so I've seen it certainly in the New Testament, the Old Testament, in history, in our lives. I felt it in me. Haven't you felt that? Where one day your love feels hotter, and another day it's cooler, right? What's your temperature at today? If I were to put a thermometer in your heart, or God work, Scale 1 to 10, where is your love? How bright is it burning as we're waiting our Lord's return from heaven? Well, uh, why do we get weary? Why do we cool off? Why do we think of throwing in the towel sometimes in love? And uh, what hap what's happening there? Well, let me give you a couple um, thoughts here from not only uh, uh, experience, but most especially scripture. Start out there with uh, Matthew 24 again. What did Jesus say? You've heard it three times now. Because wickedness is multiplied, most men's love will grow cold. So why will most men's love grow cold? Because? Oh, you guys are awesome. That's true, right? Because darkness uh, seems to be so over overpowering. And, and everywhere in the world, that can cool a person's love. So it's, in some sense, based on our environment, right? And I can think about just this last week, right? Oh, Sunday ago today was the, you know, Omar Mateen, who is that Muslim killer, walks into the nightclub and laughing, laughing like the devil, shoots people, 49 dead, 53 wounded. I mean, when you see stuff like that, and then everything else on the news, right? You got, oh, goodness, it's like so dark, isn't it? You turn on the news and it's like, oh, a Zika virus over here, and another shooting over here, and trouble on this side and that side, and it's like, ah, that darkness, that overwhelming wickedness multiplying, it can, it could, if you're not careful, make your love cool, right? Because you feel like this is just so overpowering. It's so overwhelming. Not to mention all the trouble that we see in our own lives, right? That we're facing. The darkness seems to want to try to crush the light of love that's within us. Especially in the last days. That's why Jesus said, most men's love will grow cold because wickedness is multiplied. So, another reason, secondly, that we might feel like cooling off and throwing in the towel on love is because, guess what? Love is hard. It's inconvenient. And it's difficult, isn't it? 
Now, the world would beg to differ with that, isn't it? When the world thinks about true love, right? Remember that Princess Bride? When the world thinks about true love, you know, what is the picture that it has, right? The, there's this, like, perfect ideal couple, Mr. GQ and Miss Universe, right? They're in some Swiss Alpine village in a little hot tub, sipping champagne, and everything is just absolutely perfect and comfortable and ideal. And the world goes, ah, true love, right? <laughs> when everything's perfect and easy and comfortable and convenient, well, God's love, we need to understand, is so different. You might see it there, but really, it's when it's seen best in where it's most rugged and actually bloody and difficult and gory and hard. I mean, if you think about true love for that couple would really be when after the hot tub, right? After the, that shouldn't come, by the way, before marriage, but anyway, <laughs> after the hot tub and after the marriage and after the honeymoon, that's when real love starts, right? Or at least you see it when they start to face a loss of a job, or a trouble that they face, or maybe they even lose a child. Does the love remain true? Then, that's where it's seen, when it's hard and inconvenient. And so, you know, love is hard work. Remember that story of the Good Samaritan? Of course you did, right? We always think of that as a nice, neat little story, right? Guy gets beat up by robbers on his way down from Jericho, a priest walks by, a Levite walks by, and then a Samaritan came, where he was, when he saw him, he had compassion. He went to him and bound his wounds and pouring on oil and wine, set him on his own beast and brought him to win and took care of him. The end. Right? You ever thought about what Jesus is really teaching us about love in that case? That this guy actually went in a very inconvenient moment to a very dangerous position. Because the robbers could still be there, could still come back and, and hurt this man trying to help. And he actually had to have his hands covered in blood as he helped this man. And he, he touched bruises, pouring on oil and wine. And at great cost to himself and his strength, he spent his strength putting him on his shoulders or carrying him in straining arms to lay this man, total dead weight, on his beast. Took him out of his way to an inn, reached into his pocket, poured everything out that he had to try to help this man and agreed to pay if for whatever he didn't have now, I'll pay more later when I come back. Love is hard or easy, friends. It's best seen in the rugged, tough places. Paul says it bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love is a great warrior. It rejoices in the right, even when everything's going against it. And so we can get weary sometimes in love. I hate to say it because it's hard. It's not easy. It requires efforts to, to help the poor and to love your neighbor and to set him first higher than yourself. That's one reason we can uh, fall away from it. It's not nice, neat, clean, and easy like the world thinks. It is costly and adventurous and difficult. Here's a third reason. We often don't see the fruit of our works and labors and love, do we? Now, sometimes you're... Uh, you know, sometimes you do. Praise God, and a lot of times you do. But sometimes, you know, you've you've preached to someone for years, and he's still like talking to a stone wall, right? Have you had that experience? Oh my goodness! Or you love your enemy, you do good to him, and he still hates you. Or you give some money to the poor because you think he needs to live, and he does need to live. But then you see him walking down the street with cigarettes and a pack of beer from the money that you gave him, right? Can't you get discouraged sometimes by these kinds of things? You know, love uh, doesn't always see the fruit, at least in this life, of, of what it's doing. And fourthly, is sometimes it seems that God doesn't care. Now, note, and mark very carefully those words, seem, that word seems, right? It seems sometimes like God doesn't care because you look around and after all your work, the wicked are prospering. <laughs> And the righteous are suffering after all that you've done. And that's actually seen in the Bible. In Malachi 3, the people, in verse 14, said to God, What's the good of keeping his charge, or of walking as in mourning before the Lord of hosts? Henceforth we deem the arrogant blessed. For the evil doers not only prosper, but when they put, when they put God to the test, they escape. It is in vain to serve God, they said. Were they right? Ho, 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 no. They're not right, but sometimes it seems, seems 
like God doesn't care. And so it can be disheartening. Love can cool. And one last one here for that, that part is, the devil's a great discourager. Do you know that? He's a fierce, fierce enemy. He wants to put away all love from you. And he's a great encourager of evil deeds. He's all your cheerleader in that case. But when it comes to you doing good, and you keeping the love of Christ alive inside of you, he's all together against you to stop you in every way. The great discourager uh, of love in the Christian. And so for these and other reasons, all right, love can cool. Now let's talk about how God, our Father, on this Father's Day, comes to encourage his people in love. What does he say to us to encourage us and keep our love alive so that we don't throw in the towel, not get cooler but hotter as we go? Well, first of all, he says to you, I mean this, he says, my children, it may seem at times like I don't care, but do not ever believe it, right? When we get back to this verse from Malachi chapter 3, it says this. God says, verse 14 and following, 13 and following, Your words have been stout against me, says the Lord. Yet you say, how have we spoken against you? God says to us, You have said it's in vain to serve God. What's the good of our keeping his charge, or walking as in mourning before the Lord? Henceforth we deem the arrogant blessed. For evildoers not only escape, but when they put God to the tests, they escape. How does God answer? It says, Then those who feared the Lord spoke with one another, and the Lord heeded and heard them, and a book of remembrance was written before him of those who feared the Lord and thought on his name. They shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts, my special possession on the day when I act. Now spare them as a man spares his son who serves him. Then once more you shall distinguish between the righteous and the wicked, between one who serves God and one who does not serve him. What's God telling you and me right now through that? When you feel like God doesn't care, like he's not taking note or marking good deeds and evil deeds, what does he say to us here? Do not believe it. I am so marking all of these in my book in heaven, taking note of everything. And I'm coming in the clouds of heaven. My reward, bringing my recompense and my reward with me. Amen? Amen. Why doesn't God come and immediately destroy the wicked and lift up the righteous right now? He says, I'm reserving my judgment for the day when I act. When is that day? When Jesus comes, right? Then it, then once more, you're going to st step back and consider whether I take note of these deeds or not, right? You'll judge again and judge rightly on that day. You'll see in open and full splendor that I cared about these things, right? And so don't be discouraged. God says, be encouraged. Every little deed you do, I'm writing them down in a book. And I'm coming, even a cup of cold water given to someone because he bears my name. I tell you the truth, says our Father, you shall by no means lose your reward. So be encouraged, says our Father. And then, secondly, he says, with respect to this whole idea that wickedness is winning, and that darkness is overcoming the earth, and that you feel like you're so small and you can't stand up against it, well, consider this. Jesus tells us a parable in Matthew chapter 13 about this. Let's read it and see what we can learn. He says, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while men were sleeping, the enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheats and went away. So when the plants came up and bore green, then the weeds appeared also. And the servants of the householder came and said to him, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? How then has it weeds? He said to them, An enemy has done this. The servant said to him, Then do you want us to go and gather them? He said, No, lest in gathering the weeds... You root up the wheat along with them. And watch this verse. Let them both grow together until the harvest. And at harvest time, I'll tell the reapers, gather the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned. But gather the wheat into my barn. What's Jesus telling us here in this case? Who's the one who sows the seed in this parable? Jesus, right? Who are the good seeds? The sons of the kingdom. The evil seeds, the weeds, are sown by the devil. Those are wickedness and wicked people. But notice, the angels want to come and sweep away and judge right away. What does the owner of the field say? Wait, wait, hold it back, wait for it, right? He says, let them both grow up together until the harvest, and then we'll separate the good from the evil, right? What does that tell you about wickedness? Is it's increasing in the world, is it? Yes. Certainly seems so, right? What does it tell you about good in this parable, though? 
that also is increasing and maturing in the world. Have you thought about that? The devil and, by the way, the news, only wants you to look at the evil in the world, pretty much, right? When you watch the world, when you watch the news, do you feel brighter and happier? You just want to dance around, or do you feel darker? Well, think about the word darker, right? Is that going to make your love cool? Can you keep your eyes also on the good? I saw or heard Mr. Rogers was interviewed, I think even this week. Beth was telling me, remember? You know, won't you be my neighbor? Remember that guy with the little sneakers? His sneakers famous? Well, he said whenever uh, there was a tragedy when he was a boy, his mom used to tell him, after the tragedy, look for the helpers to help him deal with it. Have you looked for the helpers after last week's massacre? Have you seen the good, the wheat springing up as well? God is encouraging you by? He would say this, look for what happened. They called for blood, right? Um, to heal the wounded and the, and the blood banks. Those blood banks were so full they had to turn people away. Chick-fil-A, which doesn't open on Sundays because of religious, you know, they're Christian, opened Chick-fil-A and served everybody free meals, everybody who gave blood, right? And then... Uh, churches were open, filled with prayer. People comforted each other. Did you see that memorial park at, at that park in Orlando? And all the candles were lit, and then a storm came and put them all out. And there was a picture of a homeless man, all bent over with packs on his back and, and filth and rags going over it, and he relit all the candles. And that picture went viral, and millions of people saw it. Do you look for the helpers? Do you see the good? Do you see the weeds? Growing up next to these poisonous weeds of the Muslim killer, do you see the wheat also maturing? God says, be encouraged by this. For as they increase, so increases the good. And don't just be a help, look for a helper, says Mr. Rogers' mom. Be one. I thought about this and I was thinking, my goodness, why am I using all this technology to make me darker? Let's make it brighter. So you know what I did? I typed into the internet, YouTube, I said, random acts of kindness. And I came up with great heroes, or real heroes, and good deeds caught on camera. I'll just share just a couple here. I saw a man whose foot was caught in a subway uh, between the train and the platform when it was stopped. Did you see this video? Right? And it's like, the, nobody can free this guy. I mean, he's totally trapped. And then someone got an idea, and 200 people on this platform all leaned against the train and moved the train. I mean, this is Superman, right? One person couldn't do it. 200 people all in love pushed the train. They moved the train, and the guy's foot got clear. I'm like, real life heroes. Do you watch this stuff? Might that inspire you? I saw a little boy that was caught on an escalator. You see this one? He's holding onto the rail on the outside, and he starts going up with it. And he gets up like 30 feet. And he's holding on the end. You know what happens at the top of an escalator, right? The thing goes around, and he's going to lose his grip. A man looks up, sees it, runs over there. Boy gets to the top. He tops over, over backwards, his head going down to the ground, 30, 40 feet. Boom. The man catches him. Might that inspire you? I even saw these, this, this highway, this busy roadway, four lanes traffic, and there was a little mother duck with 12 little ducklings passing by. <laughs> And everybody stopped. I mean, do you see that against over against the Muslim killer? I mean, think of the good that there is in the world to look at. And this inspired me. I was at the Publix the other night, and the lady before me couldn't find change enough to pay. And because I'd seen these kinds of videos, I was like, I'm looking for something good to do. I want to be here too. <laughs> and I just, oh, she, she fumbled for a second. I'm like, here, quick, let me get that for you. And I paid it for her, and she was very thankful. Um, that was easy. That was, in, that was very convenient, but I was still looking for something loving to do. And if we just let this parable sink into us that, yes, the evil weeds are maturing, you're going to see that, but the wheat is maturing. And you can be a hero. Be a helper. Be a hero, says your Father in heaven. Keep love alive. And besides this, think about this. When you think about love being hard, God says, but that's what makes it beautiful. Right? Where would we be with this whole story of the Good Samaritan, right? If he were like, flip the guy a coin. Or said, hey, have a nice day, fella. I mean, it would be no story, right? It would be no story. But because he went over there and he got his hands bloodied and put his hands on bruises in the muck of life, in the dirt and filth of life, 
That's where love is seen. And God says, but when you do that, that's what makes it beautiful in my eyes. Anybody could just love, like, conveniently. But when you love inconveniently, in the muck and dirt and filth of life, that's what's beautiful to me. So don't be discouraged by the hardness of it. Be encouraged. It's beautiful in my eyes. Look at my son. He died on a cross, gory and bloody for you. Go and do likewise. Love each other with this kind of love. And fourthly, as for the fruit, when you don't see it, you don't see the fruit when you do love a lot of times, uh, guess what? God says, but the fruit is there, even if you can't see it. Imagine you're walking along a, by a pond in the woods, and you take a little pebble, toss it behind your back, and it goes into the pool. You might hear a little plip, but what happens to the pond? One little pebble, the whole pond is filled with reverberating ripples until the whole thing is dancing with the light of the sunshine, right? Sometimes I think when I'm out there on the ocean, growing up especially, on the motorboat, I, all I see before me is unbroken sea, like glass, thinking, I'm not making any difference in this ocean. If you only look behind you, there's a spreading V-wake going out all over the place. The Good Samaritan helped this one man, and we think, done, let's go on to the next story, Jesus. But guess what? Think about this. He helped that one man, and that man came out alive. Right? He had fruit, even if he didn't see it. The Samaritan probably never even got a thank you from this guy. He probably couldn't speak. What's another ripple is the man's weeping wife at home had her husband back. And on this Father's Day, children had their daddy back. What do you think the innkeeper saw or felt when he saw a man come in carrying this wounded man with blood all over his garments, <coughs> bruised, the man is still unconscious and lays on a bed, puts his hand in and pays everything necessary for this man. Do you think the innkeeper was changed? What I'm saying to you is this. When you feel discouraged in love, let God encourage you that your little deeds of love, God says, will by no means return to you void. Good deeds are conspicuous, says the scripture. And even when they're not conspicuous, they cannot remain hidden. They will come to light. Everything that is done in darkness will be seen in the light. And so, be encouraged. Everything you're doing is worth it. It's not in vain. And God is the great encourager in all good things for our doing good. Why? Because His kingdom is all about love. This kind of love, and we see it best in Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Think about Jesus as we come toward the conclusion here. It says, He went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. He didn't cool. He was bright. And his love was seen best in the muck of this world. Not just because he went tiptoeing through the tulips here with us, okay guys? He ate with prostitutes. He was a friend of tax collectors, of sinners. He came to be a friend in the muck of this world. In your mess of your life and mine. It was seen in his trial, in the beatings of his cross. This was not a neat event, or clean, or convenient, but bloody and gory and messy and hard, and his sweat was like great drops of blood. It was in the hard parts of this life that Jesus came, found you and me, by the roadside, beaten up, half dead, and Jesus came and put his hand on your bruises and healed them. He put his hand on your blood and wiped it, pouring on his oil and wine. He bore you up in his strong arms, carried you on his strong shoulders on that cross, forgave your sins, gave you eternal life. And then he reached deeply into his pocket and he says, The full ransom price for your salvation has been paid, O innkeeper, O God in heaven. The full ransom price has been paid for these people. This is true love, friends. Not an alpine lodge, not a little hot tub, not, oh, you know, true love. But like, this is true love, Jesus Christ. And uh, he's given us the great reward of the world to come by grace through faith. It's not easy, but it's hard. It's not pretty, but it is beautiful. And he's still overcoming the darkness in this world by the light of his love within you and within me. Therefore.
Our love would be steadfast, immovable, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain, and let's not grow weary in well-doing, says Paul. For in due season, in due season, we shall reap if we do not lose heart. In Jesus' name, amen.